Let me start by saying that this is um, strange to me. Uh, I am speaking here in an empty sanctuary. Um, we are closed, as you all should know by now, um, for the next two Sundays, and so we're going to record our um, sermons and put them on the website uh, where you can have access to them. Today, <clears throat> I want to finish the uh, final of the five subjects that we were discussing uh, having to do with our small group study. And the primary scripture that we'll be using today, um, suggested by the small group study, is found in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. So before we uh, read that, <clears throat> let's have prayer. Father in heaven, we do pray that in this particular time, which is unusual and unsettled, um, unchartered waters, that you would be with us, be with our congregation, I pray, especially to, Lord, I pray in this community for both in our congregation and, and outside um, in the community at large, those that are um, medical personnel and are in the way of all that we're dealing with and are in contact each day with those um, who may be ill and can run the risk of um, contracting this virus themselves. I pray just that you would keep us safe, watch over us, protect us, help us keep our minds and not uh, panic and trust in thee that you are the everlasting God and that underneath are the everlasting arms. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> First Peter 3, Peter's writing to people who are under persecution, um, far more than anything we know, and he is trying to tell them how they should best behave in the face of difficulties of harassment, of outright persecution, of demands um, for the reason that they are Christians. And so we'll pick up in chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. <clears throat> Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Primarily 15 and 16 are the verses that we want to look at today. And I think that they, there are three things here that I want us to see. This has to do with the whole business of uh, living our life in the public and testifying, witnessing, uh, speaking the truth of God to those, he says, who ask. There's a lot here, and so I want us to look at it under these three subjects, three points. One, be purified. Two, be prepared. Three, be poised. Now, be purified. This, on the surface, looks like, in verse 15, <clears throat> I am doing something toward God but sanctify Christ as Lord. How can I sanctify Christ? This needs to be looked at a little bit, that very word sanctify. The word sanctify is everywhere in Scripture, <clears throat> but it has a number of different meanings. First of all, it means to be set apart for some divine purpose. It doesn't necessarily mean 
that the character of a person, if it's a person set apart, is itself good. In fact, set apart, the word sanctify, often more, more often in the Old Testament, means that a day, a pot or a vessel, a person, a place, is set apart for divine use. That use of the word to sanctify is primarily in the Old Testament, though not completely, the meaning of dedicating, consecrating, setting it apart for no other use but the use of God. Even in the Old Testament, this business of sanctify may not mean anything about the character of, let's say, a person who is set apart. The word sanctify or holy was used for um, temple prostitutes. They were called holy ones. Well, it doesn't mean that they were clean and pure and holy, but it does mean they were set apart to what they believed was a divine purpose. So primarily, to set apart solely for the use of God is the first meaning of to sanctify. And that is more frequently found in the Old Testament than in the New. In the New Testament, you find more often the second meaning of sanctify. And that is to make holy, to free from sin, to cleanse, purify. It doesn't lose the meaning to set apart, but it combines more frequently in the New Testament. So the New Testament use of the word sanctify is primarily what we're looking here at in 1 Peter 3. <clears throat> There are, while we're still on this subject of sanctify, there are different uses of the word sanctify as far as its application to the human. Now we'll focus on to sanctify not days, pots and pans, animals, people, places, days. We're talking about God sanctifying a heart. This says, sanctify the Lord. It's something that I, as a human, do in placing God first in my heart. But how can I do that? How can I make God first in my heart? Only as God does a work in my heart enabling me to do that. And there are several meanings here to the word sanctify. There is such a thing as initial sanctification. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but we see it in the New Testament. Um, we see people who are referred to as being sanctified who are carnal. Paul called the Corinthians famous for being problem Christians. And he said, you're babies in Christ. He called them sanctified in Christ Jesus in the initial um, greeting to the letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But in chapter 3, he turns around and he says, you are not spiritual. I have to speak to you as carnal, still fleshly. You walk like men, not like Jesus. The point here is then how can you be sanctified or referred to as sanctified or holy, which he said also he called them saints. That means holy ones. How can you be sanctified and holy and still be carnal, still be fleshly, not be spiritually minded? The only meaning, the only way we can explain that is there is an element of sanctifying that occurs in conversion. And we call that initial sanctification. Here's the 
meaning of sanctify in the first work of grace, of being saved. I am set apart to God. I'm no longer part of the world. Second, there is a cleansing. There is a, a purification that occurs in conversion. That might sound confusing, but hang on. Something is cleansed. Something's made clean and pure. My hands. James said, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Using the word cleanse, that refers to sanctified, purified. There's a second thing that is sanctified when I am converted. And here's where it gets a bit murky, but we have to explain this. There is a purification of depravity in our hearts, corruption in our hearts. That is the result of all of our own sinning. Every time I sin, I do two things. I incur guilt before God, but I also pollute my own heart. In conversion, not only is guilt dealt, dealt with, but the corruption of heart, which is called acquired depravity, is cleansed. Now, how is that different from inherited depravity in this way? Acquired depravity in a sinner's heart will vary from person to person depending on the life that they've lived, the length of time that they spent disobeying God and living in rebellion. Um, a child who, f who is converted at age 10 is, uh, has less acquired depravity, corruption of heart, than somebody who's 80. The first work of grace totally deals with personal sin and the results of my own actions. Therefore, that's why we deal with guilt, but we also deal with the pollution of the heart that occurs resulting from my own sinning. So there is a sanctification, and in Wesleyan doctrine, we call that initial sanctification. I am sanctified in the sense then that when I'm converted, I'm set apart. I get out of the world. Also, the pollution of my heart resulting from my own career of sinning is cleansed. Now, there's a second work of sanctification, and that is called entire sanctification. Paul uses that term in his prayer for the Thessalonians. Chapter 5, 23. I pray that the very God of peace himself would sanctify you entirely. What's the significance of the word entirely? Hopefully, the word entire makes sense having explained that there is an initial purification of acquired depravity. Entire sanctification completes that work. Entire sanctification does not address acquired depravity. It is addressed to inherited depravity, the bent to sinning that I'm born with. That is why Paul uses the word entire, meaning there has been a cleansing, but it's a partial cleansing. It now remains for me as a believer to be entirely purified. That is a second and distinct work from being saved or justified or converted. This is what is the synonym for being entirely sanctified, is to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is subsequent to and in addition to being converted. Now, what does that then mean with verse 15? But sanctify Christ. I sanctify Christ when he has sanctified me, enabling me to devote myself, consecrate myself completely to God. He purifies my heart because I have consecrated to him and trusted him to do that work in my heart. 
that work has to be preceded by the revelation to the Christian, to the believer, of something deeper down and farther back in our hearts. And frankly, it is that something, that remaining bent, that is subdued, grace is given to counteract it, but it's still there. That bent that still remains in the believer's heart is what clouds my testimony and makes it more difficult to be a witness for Jesus. This verse 15, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to make a defense or an, or an explanation to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. This is all about sharing the gospel, witnessing, testifying. But Peter makes it clear that a prerequisite for being a good, faithful witness, shining light for Jesus, is having a pure heart myself. That's what qualifies me for it. This lines up perfectly with what Peter heard out of the mouth of Jesus when he said, don't go into the world yet. You stay in Jerusalem, Acts 1.8, until you receive power from on high then you will be witnesses unto me, Jesus said. This then, Peter is repeating nothing but what Jesus said. I need the filling of the Holy Spirit and the purifying of the bent to sinning as a believer to qualify me to be the kind of witness he wants me to be. That's what sanctify the Lord God in your heart really means. So the question is, am I really prepared and purified sufficient that I am the kind of Christian that draws the attention of someone and says, why do you have this hope? Why are you like you are? So first, we have to be purified. This is the, this is the number one message that the church today needs. If it's number one with God, it's got to be number one with us. Second point, we need to be prepared. Not only do we need to be purified, but we need to be prepared in this sense. First, we have to have some knowledge. Um, we don't have to have a lot. But we have to have some knowledge of what it means to be a Christian, who Jesus was, and then an experience that I can share primarily I think people fear witnessing. Well, I don't know the Bible. I don't know this. I don't know theology. Someone as learned as Paul, someone as uh, filled with revelations from the Lord, always resorted not to flowery theological, systematic theology, explanations of the Trinity and all that. He resorted to his own personal experience. I was on the road to Damascus. I was a bad guy. I was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus appeared to me. And I repented, and he called me into the ministry. That's what you and I, obviously, we have nothing to testify to if we don't have a conversion experience. If we haven't met Jesus, but we have, then that's uh, the primary thing that we have to share. I can't have the Holy Spirit bring words to my mouth especially scripture, to share with somebody who asks me why you're a Christian unless I've been reading the Bible. So I, ha I must read, I must have an experience, and then there just is the, the closeness of the Holy Spirit that we maintain by our devotional life, prayer, reading the scripture, obedience, walking with God. So I have to be purified I have to be prepared enough in my intellect and in my experience that God can prompt my heart and open the door for me to say whatever he wants me <clears throat> to say. Now, finally, notice we're to be poised. And by that, if we, we read the last portion of 15, we're, we're to be prepared, always be ready to make a defense 
Give an explanation to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and reverence or respect. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Verse 16, it says, and keep a good conscience. But the footnote, the literal translation is having. In other words, it reads like this. We're to give an account of the hope that's within us with gentleness and reverence, having a good conscience. That means a good conscience is the underlying foundation for how I can then speak with gentleness and reverence. I've chosen the word poise here. The word poise means a power, a confidence, an assurance that comes from a clear conscience. There is nothing like the power of a conscience, as Paul said, void of offense toward God and man, that gives us um, the poise and the power to say to people, here's what God can do for you. The worst thing we can do is try as a flawed Christian who unfortunately may have exhibited those flaws to a watching world who then yaks about God and buttonholes people professing a God who can do for them what he's done for me when what he's done for me isn't too visible. In fact, it may be the opposite. Those are the worst kinds of advertisers for God. What God wants me to have in my heart then by having a purified heart which produces consistent conduct then those who watch me, first of all, will be prompted to ask me what I have because they sense I have something that they don't have. If I live, talk, foul up nearly as much as they do, why would they ever ask me, what do you have that I don't have? They're not going to ask you that. So the point here assumes that a purified heart leads to a ready answer and the poise that is necessary for us to be, as Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you'll be witnesses unto me. That's God's call. What he wants us to do then, and what the question we, the question we need to ask ourselves, am I purified? Do I know what it means to really sanctify the Lord God in my heart? I might just mention this before we quit. Virtually all the places, including verse 15, where the word sanctify appears, this is this particular word in 15, sanctify Christ as Lord. This is a completed action verb. And it is an imperative. It's a command. It's not good advice. It's not a hope so. It is you do this and you do it now. And you do it as completed action. This is not progressive, um, ongoing process of being sanctified. It is be sanctified and sanctify God. Put him as first in your life. This is a... Um, why in the road experience. Most of the places, the vast majority of places, especially in the New Testament, where the word sanctify appears, it is not gradual. It is not process. It is crisis. It is a why in the road where I settle it. Or as Paul said in Romans, reckon yourself, account yourself dead to sin. There's that separation. And alive unto God. That's what he wants of us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us be the kind of witnesses Jesus had in mind shortly before Pentecost, where he commanded the disciples, you wait 
until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Then you'll be witnesses. This is the crying need of the church today. Help us seek and find your will in our own individual hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.